guess what, Katie? Guess what? Ah, guess what? We're going live. Yes, right. We're going live. Oh, look. Oh, she doesn't want to be picked up. Oh, look at her. Oh, look at her. Hey. Hi. You want to say hi to all the people out there? You want to say hi to the people? She doesn't want to say hi to the people. She just wants to be over here and hang out. Hello, good people. Hi. It's Jason with Green Country Agroforestry. Back again Wednesday night, 830. It's time for another live stream. We see a whole bunch of people coming in here tonight. That's great, great, great. We got Katie in here. We got uh, Caroline's Food Forest in Florida, still in Florida. Mary is in here. Brian's in here, or he was earlier, probably still is. We got Billy for the Wickshire Project, Vicky Savage, and Jan Penland. And somebody just disappeared. Oh, see, yep, Brian went away. Hi, <laughs> Kitty. Hi, Kimber's coming in from the living room. Oh yeah, you're you're right over there. Hi, Kimber. Hi. <laughs> so good evening. Hi, everybody. We've got a picture back behind me. Have a look at that stuff. Have you seen this stuff in your yard? Have you seen it around anywhere? This particular plant? It's a lovely plant. It's got tiny little hooks on it that just grab onto your clothes or onto your, your skin, your hair, your fur, if you're a, an animal. And it, it, it'll, it'll go along with you. Those little flowers, whenever they whenever they finish up, Moose Brat's in the audio seat too tonight. Hi, hi, hi. hi. Uh, Moose Brat's been doing a lot, of, a lot of fun little videos here recently. You got to go check her out. She's been uh been busy um so whenever those little flowers go away they produce these little tiny fuzzy brown seeds they stick to your dog's fur and their ears and you've got to brush them out and mary says they're 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 a great pain because she doesn't want to spend all that time and effort getting those out of the the dog's fur with the brush of course um they're called a, a few different names it's gallium aparine is the is the the, the scientific binomial uh, bed straw, goosegrass, cleavers. Uh, Dan saying around around here they're called love grass. All right, yeah. See, whole bunch of different names for this one. Uh, a tea used to be made out of this one to uh, to treat. See, Boom Moose Brown knows the name cleavers. Tea used to be made out of this one to treat uh, certain venereal diseases. Um, they are edible, of course. There is that that anecdotal medicinal purpose i don't know if it actually works for that or not but uh there is a, a few things i do know about this particular plant aside from the fact that that mary finds it very annoying and wants me to get rid of it uh the the little brown seeds can be roasted and used as a coffee substitute not that they have any caffeine in them they're just going to taste bitter so it's kind of a, a really a substitute to give you that flavor of something kind of nasty and bitter that you're gonna drink i don't know why you want that experience but hey some people do um, the other thing that they do is accumulate lots of calcium. So if you have this growing in your yard somewhere, it's busily accumulating calcium. There's a few other plants that you can grow that accumulate calcium. There's not really a whole lot of real use for these, except, except if you happen to be raising poultry. And if you're raising poultry, this is a great way to get calcium into your bird's eggshells. So... I've been dutifully doing my, my, my husbandly duties and getting rid of the, the gallium aparine in the yard uh, because Mary doesn't like it. And yeah, making Mary happy is, is, is of course, my, my primary mission in life. What? Oh, sorry. Also making Suzu Kitty happy is another primary mission in life. So anyway, getting rid of this stuff. And, of course, it has a purpose. It has a use. And I've decided we're going to use this to, to feed the ducks, to calcium into their eggshells, strength up their eggshells, and it'll be a great and wonderful thing. I can make Mary happy, and I can do uh, something beneficial and worthwhile at the same time. There we go. So I'm sitting here, and I've got these little tiny hooks digging into my arms as I'm carrying arm loads of this stuff away. I'm doing some other work over there in the, in the front yard, too. I think we may have some crocuses coming up. I'm not sure. Uh, we've got Several different little flower bulbs are starting to emerge now that the sycamore tree is gone. Anyway, I'm thinking about how how this 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 plant here is very annoying, uh, but knowing what its purpose is makes it somewhat less annoying. So just just in the same way that I I went out and I, I spent a lot of time thinking about okay, what's the purpose of this? What, what what possible good does it do to have poison ivy in your in your food forest or in your garden? What possible good is this greenbrier for? Why do we have these things? And, and of course, you know, why does the bee have this sting? Why is it, you know, stuff like that? And the more I examine this, the more I realize that, yeah, everything has a purpose. 
And whenever you work in alignment with what, what that purpose is, it's no longer bad. It's not a detriment. It's not something to be disturbed with. And pardon me for going a little biblical for a moment, but you know, I, I was looking at Tanakh earlier. Um, Tanakh, of course, is the, 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 the first few books out of the Bible, what we call Torah. Uh, it's a record of, of, of my particular family's interaction with what we thought of as being the divine for a long, long time. And some other people picked it up, thought it was interesting, started copying it and, and, and borrowing from it for their particular practices. And I guess that's okay. I, imitation is flattery, I suppose. But um, I was getting distracted. I was looking in the very first book, which appears in the back of Tanakh. It's, it's written from the back to the front, not the front to the back. It's very unusual. But you open this up and you start looking at, at, at how the world is created. It's a really interesting uh, story, how the world is created. There's three ma major religions around the world that have been formed with this creation story. And different traditions have more or less added to or taken away from it. Um, but this story begins with mankind being placed in a garden with the idea that there was something about the world that needed fixing. It needed to be replenished. It needed to be, to be restored. And mankind is put in the garden with the purpose of, of repairing and restoring the planet. Somewhere along the line, an event occurs that causes the woman to see things differently. She starts noticing that this this plant over here, whenever I touch it, it gives me a rash and I break out and I itch. I don't like that rash. And I've and this this plant over here has got those sharp thorns on it. I don't like those sharp thorns. And that tree there, that tree, it's blocking my view, and I can't I can't see this nice river from our house here, right? I can't see this nice river. Can you get, and, and she's telling her husband here, can, can you get rid of this, this plant that makes me break out whenever I touch it? Can you get rid of that thorny thing over there? Can you cut down that tree or do something about this so that I can have that nice view of the river? And of course, man goes, okay, because he wants to, 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 make, to make the missus happy. This is, of course, the story of the fall of mankind because we started out with the understanding that the creator made everything and he made everything good. Everything was good. It's not that there weren't any of those those plants there that would give you a rash if you if you touch them or you know, rub them on places that, that were a little bit too sensitive. It's not that there weren't thorns to protect the nitrogen fixers and pioneer plants that are there. Those were all there. But before the fall, man had trust that God had created everything good. And after the fall, of course, man does not have this trust anymore. Man instead sees, well, there is this bad thing here. And it distinguishes the difference between this thing that's bad, I don't like it, this thing that this seems to be good. And so man chases after the things that they think are good, which ultimately wind up being bad for him, <laughs> and avoid the things that he sees as being bad, even though they are good for the environment as a whole. Mankind loses the ability to interact with nature as a normal, natural part of nature. In any case, once you start to to realize that the things over here, like the, the little gallium with the sharp, spiny things that stick to everything, and, and, and they do scratch up my skin a little bit, and after dealing with them, I have sort of a nice, itchy, lingering sensation afterwards that soap and water will take care of, and I presume that's from the little tiny scratches, and even now I look down and I can see where, where, where my skin is kind of mottled with with red from all those little tiny scratches there. It's, it's not entirely comfortable. But I don't think of it as bad because I understand its purpose and its place in the ecosystem. Now, I imagine if I had no understanding of what this plant was for or some of these other plants that we can encounter, I don't know what they're for. I don't understand what their purpose is. Then I can see them as being bad. Right now, around the world, the way I see it, we have two major camps out there, two big sides. And we're, we're, we're getting to really the crux of the problem here. One side, and you, you may have noticed that there's there's a pole up there at the at the top of, 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 the, uh, of the live stream. There's a pole up there 
asking you to, 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 to tell us whether or not you believe that human life is a blessing or a curse. I had to show results up there. I'm looking, I see 93% say a blessing. Hey, that's it. That's a really good, that's a really good return from this particular audience. I'm glad we have so many people in this audience that regard human life as a blessing. Um, out there overall, apparently, about 40% of the general public when polled regard human life as being some form of curse. And the problem with, with this, this viewpoint uh, of regarding human life as a curse and not a blessing is that one hates one's own life. One resents and despises the life of others. And one, if one is true to one's, one, one's, one's um, philosophical leanings, would seek genocide of the human race. That's a pretty concerning opinion for 40% of the general population to have. So really, we have two sides. We have the side that regards human life as a blessing and can regard what humans can do in a positive light. We have the side that regards human life as a curse and thinks humans are nothing but problem, 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 problem have to be eliminated. Of course, I've been studying the purpose of things. So naturally, I've been looking at the purpose of humans. I bring up the biblical story because it's culturally relevant to my particular culture. I, I only bring this up because it's culturally relevant, like I said, to my culture. Um, as Mary said, Hebrews. I'm, 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 I am an Avers. Uh, Avers came from, from, from Germany uh, right around the late 1700s. Uh, we were German Jews. It's a curse you hate. Oh, yeah. Hang on. Billy says, yeah, if it's a Hershey Kate, and that's not good. Exactly. So we escaped the Holocaust by arriving here several hundred years ahead of time. It was a wonderful thing. Uh, I personally am not Jewish. I'm of Hebrew descent. I'm a little bit of Hebrew, a little bit of Chalagi, which is Cherokee, uh, some blue blood English, uh, a certain amount of Scots on my mom's side, and a lot of German. And, you know, that's... I enjoy being a mutt. I have a bunch of different cultural influences I can I can look at and, and, and look at my ancestors and go, okay, they did things I'm proud of. They did things I'm not proud of. They did things that give me experiences that I can apply and, and, and maybe I don't have to repeat their mistakes. And stuff like that. Hmm. Anyway, I digress. I'm trying to study and find out what the purpose of humans is. If I just look at my particular cultural reference, it says the purpose of humans is to replenish the earth and do so by tending a garden. Right off the bat. Read all the way through the book, I have several times. Never once does the, the creator ever say, hey, I've decided I don't want mankind to tend the garden anymore. I don't want them to replenish the earth. I've given up on that. Forget about it. Uh, you know what? I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to have mankind replenish the earth anymore. The, the, the idea I had at the beginning, I, I, I've given up on that. Never once. So apparently, this idea of mankind being used as a tool to replenish and restore the earth is something the big guy is still fairly keen on. So, how is it? that humans are beneficial. I've spoken before about humans being a creature that fills a particular ecological niche that is somewhat akin to the squirrel. I know, it sounds ridiculous, bear with me. See, the squirrel, he likes to go around, and he's, he's looking for good food to eat. The squirrel's got a, a very discriminating palate. He loves mulberries. He likes pecans. He likes hazelnuts. He'll eat corn, especially it's fresh and on the cob. Oh, he loves corn fresh and on the cob. He likes pecans. I think he may eat some chestnuts here and there. So he's got a really good discriminating palate. He knows the good stuff. He wants to eat lots and lots of good stuff. So whenever he finds nuts that he thinks are really, really good, He's going to gather a whole bunch of them. He's going to bury them. He'll come back and get those later. Of course, 
pecan trees, oak trees, mass producing trees in general, they've got a special trick. See, they know squirrels coming around to gather the nuts. And the squirrels are going to eat a bunch of their nuts. They're going to stash a bunch of their nuts. But every few years or so, pecan says, I am going to throw out twice the nuts that I usually do. Twice the nuts. There's still the same number of squirrels out there. I'm going to throw out twice the nuts. And that means the squirrels are going to go around and gather up all these nuts because this is what they do. They gather up the nuts. These are good nuts. I'm going to stash these nuts over here. These are good nuts. I'm going to stash these nuts over here. These nuts, they're not so good. Hey, i got lots of nuts I can gather. I'm going to gather good nuts over here. Then the squirrel winds up planting trees, pecan trees, hazelnut trees. But the squirrel can only carry those nuts so far. A human being can carry those nuts across continents, over mountains, across oceans. Theoretically, one of these days, maybe beyond this planet to somewhere else. That's a powerful agent to aid in the propagation of these plant species that are our friends and allies on this planet, right? Humans do this. There's no other creature that does it. Only humans do it. Humans have the capacity to see a problem with soil erosion and go, oh, I can fix this with a couple of minutes and a stick or my shovel. Or perhaps maybe I'm going to plant some some, some of these, these dense hedges over here that's going to divert that water off over this way, let it settle down into the land, create an area where a lot more things can live and thrive and grow. Random, random chance incidents in nature don't cause these things to happen. Humans do. Whenever humans are working to improve their own ecosystem because they're, they're tied in and involved with, in the process with their ecosystem. When humans are living as a natural being on the planet, this is what happens. Humans are not the bad thing. They're not the problem. Humans are the solution to the problem. And so that's the reason why I personally say that human beings are a blessing, not a curse. A human life is a blessing, not a curse. Look, 17 minutes in, we've already covered everything. Ha! So hi everybody. Let me come up here and, and have a look and see what you guys have been saying. We'll do a little bit of, of, of talk back and forth. Pet a little kitty over here. Hi, kitty kitty. All right. So we're starting talking about goosegrass, chickens, chickens and rabbits love it, or kid chickens, ducks, ducks love it, chickens and rabbits love it. Yeah, because especially around where you drain the ducks water. So we get plenty of this stuff. If you don't use it, it just sits there and it creates those little tiny little fuzz balls. They get everywhere and, you know, it gets stuck to your clothes and people don't like it. So I pull this stuff up and I put it to use. Uh, let me see. Quick question from Billy. Can I use any fresh grown greens to make a nitrogen tea boost tea booster in a bucket of water? Well, you'll get some nitrogen out of any green vegetation as it rots down. There'll be some that you get back out of it. Some is better than others for, for nitrogen. So clovers, alfalfa, uh, sea buckthorn, uh, any of your leguminous plants are better for, for, for nitrogen. So have a look around, see what you got. Um, you may find something growing close by black locust for example that you might want to chop up and put in there for, for a nitrogen boost i've been growing a lot of alfalfa so i've got little little banks that i've been building up there's a tree in the middle this is maybe about four foot across eight ten foot long tree in the middle some herbaceous perennials around it uh, clover and alfalfa cut two different types of alfalfa clover and alfalfa around that Maybe some other little flowers, daffodils, things like that. Um, some sort of onion or allium or garlic or horseradish or who knows what else. A few more flowers, probably, probably elder flowers, maybe some violets. Uh, let's throw in some mint, stuff like that. Over and over again, all over the place. Different trees, different mixes of everything. And I try to keep a lot of that alfalfa growing. Now that it's in the second year... It's coming back and it's bigger and we're going to be able to see the flowers coming up on it soon. It's not great for honeybees. <laughs> Alfalfa is not great for honeybees. 
Uh, it, it's just fine for bumblebees and sol the larger solitary bees. It's not a problem. But the flower structure is such that it's kind of like a snapdragon. And whenever whenever the insect lands on the on the lower petal in order to get to the nectar or to get to the pollen, whatever it is that they're after with this fire, they, they're still after the nectar, the, the top of it will pop and smack them on the top of the head. Well, of course, on the bumblebee, this will just throw a big old puff of pollen in the air. And lo and behold, hey, congratulations, we're pollinated. Um, and probably a couple other things around just got pollinated too as it went snap. <laughs> it doesn't hurt the bumblebee, but honeybees don't like it. It doesn't hurt them, they just don't like it. But that's fine. I've got other things for the honeybees to visit and enjoy. All right. Green briar. See, this is interesting. See, there's there, there's that rule about pioneer species that that says usually if you see the thorns on them, they're 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 doing something particularly useful in the environment because they need those thorns to protect them. If they, if they weren't particularly useful in the environment, then they wouldn't need the thorns to protect them, right? Greenbrier is an interesting plant. You find it growing early in the spring. You snap, snap off those little tips. You just pop them right in your mouth and eat them. They taste a little bit like asparagus. And I mean real good, fresh from your garden asparagus, not the nasty stuff that comes in a can. Nice, nice, nice flavor to it. Um, of course, this is what the deer do. They walk around, they browse on the green briar tips, and you can f figure out where the deer have been along a game trail by looking for those uh, for those green briar tips. If they've been grazed upon, the deer has passed by here recently. If they haven't been grazed upon, the deer hasn't been through here recently. Pretty simple tracking stuff. Now, the question is, why does the green briar have those thorns if it doesn't do something special? What is it doing? And I, I don't really know. I don't know what, what it is exactly that the green briar brings to the party that necessitates those briars, but it's got them and it must have them for some reason because I have faith <laughs> that my creator did not make this particular plant with no good reason. It has to be here for some particular purpose. I just don't know what it is. So I'm not going to, to hate the plant and say, oh, it's bad because I don't know what its purpose is. Same thing with human beings. If I didn't understand what the purpose of human beings was, having faith in the creator that he did not make humans out of error. Humans are inherently good, but they may have been taught some bad things along the way. And of course, those bad things have led us to the position where we've got large portions of the population hating themselves and teaching our children to hate themselves and to hate each other. Uh, they're, they're spreading division and they're spreading hate. They're, they're masquerading it with a rainbow and calling it love. It's very, very disturbing to watch the, 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 the destruction of civilization occurring around me. <laughs> Water the dog, she'll sprout. <laughs> Vicky says, I'm very fortunate to be totally immune to poison ivy. And I'm getting ready to tell you how unfortunate you are. Are you ready? This is great. Because of the purpose of poison ivy. Now, it might be possible that you have no need of it whatsoever, in which case you are very, very fortunate indeed. But the purpose of poison ivy, as I've discovered, is medicinal. It's good for those situations where you've got maybe a, a, a cut or an infection that won't heal. Your immune system won't fight this for some reason. It doesn't see this infection as something it's supposed to fight. And so it just sits there and it festers for, for days, maybe weeks on end, festering wound. This is not good. You can be treating with antiseptic washes. You get, get your horse mint, make tea out of it, wash that down, trying to kill off the infection, but your immune system is not fighting it. And, of course, your body is maintaining that 98.6 degrees, moist environment. It's great for bacteria to grow in, and your immune system is not fighting it. This is bad. You need to get your immune system to get up off of its backside and get to work. So you find urtica dioecia. No, ur not urtica dioecia. I mean, you could. That might help shock your immune system, too. You find... Roos radicans, or any other member of the Roos genus, maybe not the, the lemonade shumix that you can find growing on the mountainside. I don't know if that's going to be necessary, enough to, to, to provoke the necessary response. But you find this Roos radicans usually growing in the lowlands, easy to find. Has three little leaves, easy to spot. Sometimes those leaves have little blistered appearance. Those are the good ones. <clears throat> you take that and you apply it to the area around where you have the infection that won't heal. 
your body has immune response, sends white blood cells to the area going, oh my gosh, attack whatever is here that's causing this, this horrible histamine reaction that we're experiencing. And it finds the infection that it was ignoring and fights the infection. So hopefully you will never have an infection your immune system fails to fight. So you do not need the medicine that is in the poison ivy plant because being immune to it would, would be kind of a bummer if you needed it. All right. Galway Roy says, missing your video to Congress debate against good border security and enforcement of the country. Roy. You know, Glenn Beck is having a premiere right now, too. Probably pretty good stuff, actually. <laughs> Fortunately, it'll be, it, it's not like the hour one live where, where it's gone after it's been up. We can, we can go back and watch it later. I probably will. So, yeah. So these stories that we're talking about, the, 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 the old story of Man in the Garden, all of that. Long, long, long before before we had before we had uh, written language the way we have it. Although during during Avram's time, he was he lived in he lived in Chaldea, which was the the very very hinterlands of the Sumerian Empire after the fall of the Sumerian Empire. A place called Ur was the name of the town. His father was a was a, a maker of idols. This is fun. I love this story. Occasionally, we'll hear a rabbi tell it. It, 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 it. I always, always love hearing it. So, here's the story: Avram is living in his father's home in the city of Ur. His father makes idols. Avram does not believe that these idols are, in fact, gods. Although it is apparently the practice that everyone is to treat them as if they were. Very, very bizarre practice. He thinks it's silly. And so one day while his father is off, he takes the idols and he takes some of them, he turns them over, he smashes others, and he moves them around on their pedestals as if they had just been having a battle amongst the, amongst themselves. And of course, he, he leaves the room and, and goes on about his business. Later, his father returns and he's angry at, at Avram and says, why have you done this? Why have you taken the all of the idols that we that I, I spent all this time making for the for the household, and why have you destroyed them? He goes, "Oh, well, they 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 had a disagreement amongst themselves, and they they fought amongst themselves." His father didn't believe this, of course, which demonstrated the fact that he was worshiping false idols. Obviously, these aren't gods. Obviously, they don't have wills of their own. Obviously, they could not animate themselves and attack each other. So. So here's Avram being being being, being the 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 smart Alec and the and the religious iconoclast early on in his career in Ur. So that's a story that's yeah thousands of years old. Of course, Avram later becomes known as Avraham, and in English it becomes Abraham. Of course, that's where our family gets its name. Yay. Oh. Everybody's saying hi to everybody. Katie says she's immune to poison ivy too. Um, prolonged exposure, especially whenever you're younger, to the point where you, know, you can do one of two things, right? Either you get exposed to it and your body goes into shock because you're exposed to, to so much of it, and you get an extreme allergic reaction, which happens. For some people, this happened to me once with uh, with wasp venom. One year, I was stung so many times that uh, the doctor said, "The next time you get stung, you might need to come into the hospital." I was like, "Well, can we get an epipen?" Well, we don't think it's quite that bad. I thought, "Oh, great, thanks. I'll just cross my fingers and hope that it's not that bad." Then <laughs> the other way, of course, is is you slowly become adjusted and accustomed to to this thing that you used to have an allergic reaction to use it used to your body used to treat it like a toxin and and eventually it stops bothering you this of course would be building up immunity or tolerance yay we the color your lighting it was getting a little dark in here um i found a, a poison ivy plant growing along the side of the house that actually made me break out 
And so I'm, I'm in a quandary. I don't want to get rid of all of it. I want to save this one just in case I wind up needing it. Who knows? I might need that poison ivy someday to do what poison ivy does. We're 30 minutes in talking about the purpose of man. We're talking, of course, we're talk, we're talking, of course about mankind, human beings, whether or not human beings are, are a blessing or a curse. If you're the category that believes, as I do, that human beings are a blessing, then, of course, we would be in serving our best interest to find what our purpose is on this planet and get engaged in it. I used to say, and I guess I still do because I'm saying it right now, that uh, things that serve their purpose are happy. But things that don't serve their purpose are unhappy and they're easily broken. And you can you can see an illustration of this with the with the um, the use of your your screwdriver to pry open the lid of paint cans or use like a chisel. If you keep on doing this, the utility of your screwdriver to function as a screwdriver will be lost. The tip's going to become damaged. They become bent, uh, chipped. If you use your pair of pliers like a hammer, it may have enough heft in it that you can bang it against something and maybe drive a nail with it a few times. Sure, not a problem. But whenever you bang with your, your pair of pliers, you loosen that joint that enables it to function as a pair of pliers. You cause it to cease to function properly because you've used it in a way of not according to its purpose. You've caused it to break. you cause it to wear out. These are consequences. Um, they're not punishments. If I use my pliers as a hammer and I lose the use of my pliers as pliers, it's not because God is punishing me. Even if a prophet came along sometime in the past and said, thou shalt not use your pliers like a hammer, my son. Okay, fine. The fact that I use my pliers like a hammer and discover that they don't function anymore as pliers is not divine punishment. It's simply a consequence. And the prophet was there to tell me, hey, the world is set up according to certain principles. If you, if you behave in accordance with those principles and in alignment with your purpose, you're going to have a happy life. If you don't, things are going to kind of suck for you. This is not how we were taught in our religious institutions. We were taught condemnation, condemnation and judgment in our religious institutions. We were not taught guidance. <laughs> Which is funny because coming from that particular tradition as I did, we find the proverb, spare the rod, spoil the child. And I had parents that were very, very into making sure that I was not spoiled. Of course, when one reads deeper into it, you begin to realize that that rod, pardon me a moment, I have one. I will just go grab it real quick. Woohoo! Oh no, he disappeared. Where did he go? Oh my gosh. He was abducted by aliens. That's what it was. Aliens, I tell you. Look, wait, wait. What's this? He's coming back. Okay, here we go. I happen to have a rod right here. It's called a Stockman's cane. It has this nice little hook on the end. It's about five foot long or so. Whenever I Hold it at the end of my arm and reach up. I've got it about 11, 12 foot extension where I can reach up and grab a branch, pull it down. This is usually used for managing livestock. Sheep, geese, that sort of thing. Goats. Now, the purpose of the rod is not to punish errant sheep. It is to gently guide them where they need to go so they can be safe. And if it was the proper shepherd's tool, we would have a, a leather wrapping here at the end and a heavy stone that's used to crush the head of the foes that might seek to harm said sheep. So the rod is never used to harm the sheep. It is used to protect them. It's used to guide them, but it's not used to harm them. And, um, I guess you, you kind of have to know a little bit about some of these cultural traditions to understand some of the phrases that wind up in these in these uh, stories. Yeah. Well. 
Well, you would think that, with the exception, of course, that the, the description said that every plant that, 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 was, uh, that, was, that was good and pleasant to eat, etc., etc., bearing fruit after its own kind was there. And there are an awful lot of really, really delicious fruit plants that have thorns. Were those just left out? Was it really every plant that was good? Or do we just like leave out some because they're not as good as others? All right, Cowboy Roger, Rogers is checking out. Oh, night. Okay. Carol says there's something called Biden's Alba out there called Beggar Weeds, something similar to that. There's a couple of different varieties of, uh, of, of galliums. Now, uh, Mary's mother has an extreme reaction to, to poison ivy as well. She'll, she'll look at it and break out, she said. All right. You know, human life is certainly a blessing to humans. Otherwise, we'd not exist. Yeah, it, it's, it's become, really, th at this point, now we have people who are advocating for the elimination of human beings as if human beings were some sort of a pest to be disposed of. It's very, very troubling. <laughs> human beings are a blessing when they're not driving. You know, if we were all busily tending our own gardens and enjoying the abundance of thereof, we probably wouldn't have a need to do so much driving. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't need commerce and we wouldn't need people to, to haul freight. It's just there wouldn't be as much of a need for it. Yeah, this is the, this is the, this is the thing. Squirrels will never stockpile bad nuts. They only stockpile the good ones. So the squirrel is busy out there going, "This is a good nut. I like this. Nut. This is a good nut. I like this. Nut. I don't like this one so much. I'm not gonna." So trees that produce bad nuts, the squirrel isn't spreading them around. Trees that produce bad nuts, the humans, if the humans are acting in a natural fashion, the humans aren't spreading them around. They're going, oh, these nuts aren't so good. We're not going to spread these nuts anywhere. Maybe they're good for where they're at. Possibly they're good for where they're at. Maybe this is a spot where this nut tree needs to grow because whatever reasons. But we're not going to carry them around and plant them anywhere else. Let me see. We got hascaps originating in Japan, and someday we'll grow here at the shack. I, I have yet to experiment with the hascap. It's you know it's kind of the honeyberry, is uh, is what it's called. Apparently, they're related to honeysuckle, except you get a, a full, full berry. They look larger than blueberries. They're blue like blueberries, and I have yet to to, to experience them. I know St Stefan Sokoviak has a bunch of them up there in uh, in Quebec. Birds and yeah, I, I I have found a few sunflowers that have been definitely picked up and dropped by a bird, as if they they've decided in between the feeders and wherever it is that they're nesting these these chickadees and titmouses and titmice, chickadees and titmice and uh, and others, uh, they'll pick up a sunflower seed from the from the feeder and they won't eat it on the spot. They'll carry it back to wherever they're nesting and sometimes they'll drop it. And so now I've got sunflowers popping up. I can I can now track. <laughs> I can track, based upon where these plants are showing up, the direction that the bird is flying from the feeder to its nest. And whenever I, I find a spot where there are no sunflowers appearing, I know we've passed where this nest is. I can start looking around for it. And I've, I've, I've spotted a few uh, I've spotted a few little cavities where there are definitely some cavity nesting birds at. They aren't visiting our bird feeders. I don't know why they're not bird feeders. They aren't visiting our our little bird houses that we bought and, and hung up for them. 
I don't know why they're not visiting those. I guess maybe if they have enough natural tree stumps and, and, and hollows that they can make nests in, they're, they're happy to do that. But now I know that I can, I can track them <laughs> by putting a sunflower seed in that, in that feeder and then looking and seeing where that sunflower appears. If that sunflower appears in the line, t -t 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 -t, going back to this tree over here, well, I know they're nesting in that tree. I can go and like I can look around until I can find the hollow. I'm not half tempted to rig up a little little GoPro camera up there or something and just let it let it let it record or maybe set up a trail cam. Um, I've got one around here. I can probably set up. Billy got some clover. They didn't have alfalfa at the cups. Clover it was. Get alfalfa whenever you can. Yeah, if, if you can get large quantities, inoculated. Get inoculated. The first year I, I was sowing that, and I did that video where I, was, where I had the, the, the little pink paper with a big N on it for the nitrogen. And it was talking about uh, don't, 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 don't get the, the nitrogen or the alfalfa pellets. Grow your own instead. There's no reason not to not to still use pellets until you've got enough of your own supply of alfalfa but that first year the the seed that i got because i've been growing clover successfully i assumed that i had enough of the appropriate kind of bacteria in my soil this is what you know what happens when you assume things so i got uninoculated seed and i planted uninoculated seed the clover came up just fine not a problem the 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 alfalfa kind of came up and then it didn't it didn't do much of anything it got choked out quick it didn't respond the way i expected alfalfa to grow in this case it makes its own growth hormone this plant should shoot up like a rocket it should be good and healthy and it doesn't wasn't doing anything it fizzled and i figured okay well next time around i'll try a different source of seed and make sure i got inoculated stuff this time around it took so now i've got second year alfalfa plants coming up fun stuff um, but keep on looking for it. It's, it's, it's a great plant to have. Lots of pretty, pretty flowers. Attracts other pollinators. Not great for honeybees, but good for other bees. And, of course, it's a perennial. You can keep on cutting it back, and it will grow back, and you can use it over and over and over again. I know some people like comfrey, but alfalfa is a great one. <laughs> yeah, happy gardens and flower shuts when the bees. It's like a little snapdragon. Pop. Hello there, says we have clover with purple under the leaf, and one leaf has the flavor of a whole blackberry. Oh my goodness. That sounds wonderful. I'd like to see some seed for that. <laughs> I've never been able to, to successfully collect clover seed. I, I, I know people do it because you know, I've, I've been able to buy it, but I don't know how to do it. I guess you have to wait until the flowers are about to wilt and die and then you go and you pick the flowers and maybe dry them and then knock the seeds out maybe like that or is that too late is it too late at that point i don't know i don't know great news from heterodox got asparagus bursting out of the ground and can't keep up that means a great time to start dividing so next year divide it <laughs> spread it around give some to your neighbors so they won't be so they won't be knocking on your door going, hey, give us some food. They'll have their own. Let's see. Yep. This is the purpose of thorns. Thorns in, uh, in pioneer species is stop herbivores from eating it. A lot of your, your, your best nitrogen-fixing pioneers, some, some of the very best ones, uh, are, are subject to being grazed upon extensively by herbivores because most nitrogen fixing plants have a higher concentra concentration of protein. This isn't true of all of them, and it isn't true of all high protein plants either. For example, alders, cottonwoods, aspens, things of that nature. Very, very high crude protein in the leaves, but don't have any particular defenses that I am aware of uh, to, to protect them from herbivores, other than the fact that you know the leaves are kind of tough and hard to eat. It can be fine for a goat, but we're not going to eat them. But that's fine. You can grow these as fodder trees and allow your goats to eat fodder, and you can enjoy the milk. Uh, <laughs> nothing wrong with a little goat's milk here and there. Yeah. Let's 
So those thorns are intended to stop the herb herbivores from eating the entire plant so the plant can live long enough to do its job, which is repair the soil, prepare it for, uh, for other things to grow. Heterodox has got an Aronia first year, one bud. You have to let us know how it turns out. I've, I've, I've heard mixed reviews. Some people say it's great. Some people say it's, oh, I like it. I have never tried them myself. Fun, fun. So we're going to have to go over there and check out your cam tomorrow whenever whenever, whenever it's light out. Hopefully it won't be uh, in the middle of a thunderstorm, but we'll see. <laughs> Hello there. First video I saw was the pee in the 55-gallon drum of wood chips for nitrogen. That's an excellent way to make some fertilizer, but I've got several other ways to make fertilizer. They don't all necessarily require uh, using your own urine or anyone else's. So, um, yeah. <laughs> of course, if you want, where did I put it? Yeah, I, I, I'm horribly, horribly distracted. If you live in the United States, you can always go buy potassium nitrate. You can't. You can't buy it. I, I discovered this is very, very appalling. I wanted to, to restock my supply. I, I do have some that's in the in, in my first aid kit for the treatment of angina. This is what potassium nitrate, medicinally speaking, is for. Whenever it's chemically pure, chemically pure enough for, for medicinal or pharmacological use, just take a, a couple of little beads of this potassium nitrate, put it under the tongue of a person that's <gasps> experiencing heart uh, chest pains, and within a very, very short amount of time, the chest pains subside, and they get to the point where they can breathe again. It's like, this is very useful if you're going to be living in a period of time whenever um, access to medical care may be limited for some reason. So just saying it's a good idea to have this stuff around. And I wanted to replenish my supply. So I decided to go to the pharmacy because I, that's where I'd gotten some a few years ago. And I'd taken some and used a little bit for various experiments, made my own, and then compared the two. And it was you know, lots of fun. Um, but I realized I did not actually have any pharmaceutical grade available potassium nitrates any, any, anymore, not really enough to, to, to be of any use. And so I went to the, the pharmacy and said, oh, have you guys got it? Some of them, some of them that didn't have a professional pharmacist uh, that I talked to, was just the kid behind the counter, he looked at me like a grown an extra head. I had no idea what I was talking about. Went, well, we have, we have potassium gluconate. Like, no, that's... That's, that's that's something else entirely. We got potassium chloride. No, that's for muscle cramps. Um, so they they didn't know what I was talking about. The pharmacist, though, uh, nice Iranian guy, knew exactly what I was talking about. I said, oh no, we don't we don't carry it anymore. And uh, so I went on Amazon and found three pounds reagent grade, which is slightly higher higher purity than pharmaceutical grade. It had been milled, which that's fine. It's it's going to be in a powder form, and that's. I, I, I can deal with that. I can always uh, turn it into tablets or pellets or whatever you need. Um, but if you're not living in the United States, you can't just go on Amazon and order potassium nitrate and have it appear at your doorstep. Shoot, around here you can get you can get nitrate, you can get sulfur, and you can get charcoal all at the same time. Sometimes all at the same store, um, and it's for gardening, people. It's all for gardening. Come on now. I know we're subversive, but hey, uh, we're not that kind of subversive. Our idea of overthrowing the government is making them superfluous and unnecessary so that they just sort of disappear like a mist on a sunny day. Uh, yeah, briars, also a place for small animals to have a safe place to hide from predators. Of course, we're for, for those of us that were that were raised in the South, we know about Br'er Rabbit being born in the Briar Patch. Uh, you know, a good blackberry thicket also is is a place where you can see a jackrabbit disappear really quick, and you know you're not going to go chasing after him. There's there's just no way. Those <laughs> those thorns are going to grab a hold of you and stop you before you can get a foot. But, but a big old bear is going to come to the same blackberry thicket, turn around, get his back into it. He's going to start doing this. Womp, 
walk, walk, walk. And after he's cut a hole in the side of the blackberry thicket about big enough for him to turn all the way around in, he's just going to sit there for a few hours and go, oh, I'm going to eat all the blackberries. So you see blackberry bushes that have this little semicircle smashed into them. That's a bear. That's a bear that visited. So, so you can look around, find the bear tracks, figure out where the bear went, and then decide whether or not you want to go tangle with a bear or not. Yeah, I was born in the briar patch. Don't throw me in that briar patch. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we can catch. That's that's what I was saying. It's, it's, I like going to, to to premieres and lives and chatting with people. It's it's fun. You know, I think, well, why do you want to talk with Glenn Beck's audience? Well, I mean, a lot of Glenn Beck's audience are preppers. <laughs> and a lot of preppers would like to have the kind of things that, 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 ah, turn that light on. A lot of preppers like to have the kind of things that we have after sale. It's food storage that, that's there in the ground and it keeps on growing and it keeps on making more. And it's not just for one emergency. If you need to, you can live on it for a lifetime. That's that's being prepared. <laughs> yeah, Hugo Homestead in the house. Hi. Right. So yeah, going back going back to, to the story about Abraham and and, and this his father's idols. I mean, this this is the family business. So it's he, he's he's smashing the things that are part of the family business. But it, it's obvious that uh, they can't independently act. They're just inanimate objects. They are not imbued with the power of gods. And his father is sitting here fuming because he's 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 got to admit this or not say any say anything. So he doesn't say anything. Um, Abraham takes off on his own from there. He wanders, wanders the earth, really. Uh, goes all, all across the, 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 the Middle East uh, as, far as, as far as where Israel is today, down to Egypt. Uh, one of his cousins, I think his name was Laban, Laban um, went off away from Ur after, after Chaldea sort of fell apart. Um, set up his own thing uh, in an area called Medea, and eventually his descendants be became the Midianites. That's where that's where the volcano god Yahweh came from. Uh, that's the one that Moses encountered whenever he was uh, on the run from Egypt. And of course you're going, wait a minute, <laughs> A regional volcano god. It's like, yeah, that's a regional volcano god. Originally, our god was was called El Shaddai, the Almighty Provider. That would be the the name that Abraham would call. Is it the same god? Is it a different god? Uh, is it curious that whenever Moses speaks to this entity in the burning bush, the entity refuses to identify itself? Uh, is that kind of suspicious and demonic behavior? Yeah, it is. But uh, we we kind of gloss over that and don't pay any attention, right? Got to be really, really careful whenever you start digging into another cultural's and another culture's old myths and superstitions and using it as a basis to build your own religious traditions. Just say it. <laughs> I, I know what part of the conversation we're at. Yeah. <laughs> I have around here somewhere a, a device that's used for lifting the lid of paint cans. There's a tool for that, so you don't have to use your chisel. Oh God, don't please don't use your chisel. You don't have to use your screwdriver. Please don't use your screwdriver. So your your tools that are, are for other specific purposes don't get damaged. You don't use your knife. Uh, yeah. Drink goat smoke from goat spit on poison ivy. That might work. I, I, I did drink an awful lot of goat smoke from goats that ate poison ivy and a bunch of other things. 
<laughs> Mary wasn't even born in a hospital. That's right, she wasn't. She was born at home. It says hospitals are where people go to die, and she'll live forever at this rate. There you go. <laughs> I feel your pain, Billy. I do. We used to have a really big black uh, black walnut tree back on the farm, and it was away from everything else. So this tree was by itself. Uh, Grandpa didn't know which exactly which trees to plant with a black walnut, but he wanted a walnut, so he just put it one place where he could have its own space. And so this black walnut tree is sitting out there by itself, provide a little bit of shade. So at some point, uh, they poured a concrete slab with a goalpost, and you could go out there and play half court basketball. We're in the middle of the sticks, but we're playing half court basketball. We've got you know an actual court goal and everything no fence around it so whenever you missed your basket you had to go chasing after the ball and it could go a ways because that was kind of downhill but we had the court <laughs> and this walnut tree stands sitting all over it, casting its shade the walnuts had come off and some of them would eventually wind up being gathered on the surface of the of the court the concrete here uh because the grass has grown up around the edges right and now that the bare concrete is here is sort of a low spot and a flat place where this these walnuts can fall and catch. So after they've fallen down and they've been down for a while, and the husks have all turned dark and wrinkled up and dried, you can take them and you can you can either put a cement block over them or you can put them underneath your boot and just scuff them back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until the the husk comes off. And then you've got this 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 walnut here, and yeah, you wind up taking a hammer or a rock or whatever you got. And a rock sometimes doesn't do it. You bang it on, it's, it's not working. But we've got this concrete pad here, so you can take your ball peen hammer and go crack some mash, as as they say, and, and then take those bits and pieces of shell and move them out of the way and pick out these little tiny bits of nut meat. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort getting those black walnut nut meats out. But I'll tell you what, they are so delicious. Uh, black walnut ice cream, it's it's a luxury. Yeah, it's one of the only ice creams I actually eat because I, I know how much of that a trouble and an effort it is to get those nut meats out of the black walnut tree. You can grow English walnuts. English walnuts are, are English walnuts is English walnuts are good. Very easy to open up the shell. You can just pop that entire shell wide open and have two 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 halves. The nut meat comes away in a nice package in the middle. You knock that bit of matrix out and you just have a nice little ball of fat and protein that's that's great for your heart, good for your brain, wonderful for your body. And you can gobble those up all day long. But they take a long time to grow. And they do produce jugalone. So you've got to be careful about what you plant around them. But fortunately, at greencountryagroforestry.com, there is a list of plants that work just fine along with walnut trees. So you can include those in your food forest and not worry about missing out on any of the good stuff. So there. But black walnuts are absolutely tasty. Hello, there's like 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 my mother-in-law can look at the poison ivy and get it. Yeah. Wait, wait. I just jumped out. We got more people that came in. Oh, I see. I, I'm missing everybody. David's here. What? Oh, there's David the Good. <laughs> well, you're one of my favorite people, David. <laughs> whenever, whenever. Okay, so whenever I'm cracking open the Tanakh and I'm reading, right, I'll ask people, hey, what was God's first commandment? What was the first commandment that God ever gave? And some people will go, well, he said don't kill or don't murder. I'm like, No, no, that's not what it says. It says, I am the Lord thy God, and you shall have no other gods before me. That's what the first commandment is. And I go, nope, that's not what the first commandment was at all. Go, go, go read the book again. And you don't have to read far because you'll find it in Genesis right there. It says, be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> That's, that is the first commandment. The first. The first commandment. It's never been rescinded, as far as I know. God has never said, I want mankind to stop being fruitful, and I want mankind to stop multiplying. Never said it. Hasn't happened. As far as replenishing and restoring the earth, now God's never said, I've changed my mind. I don't want mankind to replenish and restore the earth anymore. So sorry. I've changed my mind. My bad. 
<laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I made a mistake when I created humans. I'm like, what can I say? You know, it's the first time I've done this. Uh -huh. You try creating a universe from scratch. See what happens. No. Oh. God never says, I don't want mankind to, 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 to replenish the earth, to, 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 to tend it, to watch over it, to have custody over it. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. You're, you're, you're going to have to start counting on toes now. Unless, you know, there's some polydactyly going on. <laughs> now to work on all the other commandments. There you go. Lord, the love that God with all, all the heart, the mind, the strength. Something like that. <laughs> and love thy neighbor as thyself, which is curiously like unto the first commandment. Very, very interesting that Jesus puts it that way, huh? Almost as if he's trying to tell us something. See, you got lots of fans here, David. <laughs> Oi. Lori says she asked about you. Where are you at? Zone four, I think. Lori, you guys are you guys are you guys are that way from us quite a bit up there in the up there in the frozen north. Meow meow. Hi, kitty. Do you want to be on the show? No, you just want attention. Okay, I've got a kitty that wants some attention from us. So anyway, yes. In conclusion, Mankind is not the problem. Mankind is not a curse. Mankind is a blessing, and mankind is the solution. It's just a matter of returning mankind to mankind's natural purpose and being a natural creature on the on the earth again. So that's it. That's 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 the show. I, I kind of jumped ahead to get get to get to the bottom of the comments. I'm glad I did. Otherwise, I wouldn't have realized David was even in here. Yes, Kitty. Oi. Oh, Billy said I'm about 10 minutes behind. <laughs> Oi. Say hi, kitty. She won't look at you. She doesn't like people. She barely tolerates me. She just wants the attention. <laughs> Meow. Hey, guess what? Remember Sergeant? Your Uncle Sergeant? The cat that lives outside that looks just like you that you don't like? Remember him? Yeah. I gave him a gopher earlier today. No, I'm a liar. It was yesterday. A gopher, yeah. It's it's like a mouse, but it's, it's bigger. And they like tunnel underground. And they like to eat tree roots and stuff. Yeah. She doesn't care. <laughs> she, she doesn't care. <laughs> All right. All right. What was that about comfrey? I just... I just heard something about comfrey, right? <laughs> I've decided I'm not going to grow comfrey. If I grew comfrey, I'd have to sell comfrey. And if I if I grew comfrey and I sold comfrey, um, that then then I'd be in competition with, with with the pimp daddy of permaculture, and and I, I'd be hurting his bottom line because people would buy his comfrey from me and not from him. So I, I have to stay out of the comfrey business because I, I I don't want Billy to be on street corners with a sign. That says we'll butcher for food. All right. <laughs> David was asking. Uh, hey, I should do that. I also should send you send you the uh, an email with the, the files that I have for uh, for temperate food forests. Let's see. Uh, the name of the plant here, David, is Gallium aparine, and it grows. Yeah, it grows. It grows in my yard. It grows everywhere. It grows in everybody's yard. Uh, other names are goosegrass, cleavers. Um, what are other names for it? Some, somebody mentioned another name. Hey, don't, don't bite me. Nuts. She just wants her attention. Uh, goosegrass, cleavers is another name for it. It's a dynamic accumulator for calcium. That's that's about it. And, of course, since it, it picks up so much calcium, we use it to, to feed the, the ducks to strengthen up the eggshells. So it's not... It's not a, a useless weed. It actually has a purpose. 
it's just um, somewhat obnoxious whenever it winds up being, being in the places where people are trying to walk. Whew, New York City going to charge a tax for meat, have to reduce the CO2. You didn't say the quiet part. Yeah, the carbon that they want to reduce is you. It, it's, it's, it's extremely sad. I'm going to go on my soapbox for just a moment and talk about this. It's extremely, extremely sad because there actually really is. There actually really is a climate crisis. It's a climate crisis that dates back about 65, 66 million years or so. Uh, that's whenever we, whenever we had the first incident of this particular climate crisis. Uh, Ten kilometers, that's the depth of the mesosphere, the, the space between the surface and the bottom of the eye. Of, is it the ionosphere? The ionosphere, yes. Um, this is where most of the breathable air is. The object that struck the Earth near uh, uh, Chicxulub in Yucatan 65, 66 million years ago was 10 kilometers in diameter. That means, well, imagine you've got a tennis ball in your hand and you've got a, a small puddle. That's about the depth of a tennis ball. And you take the tennis ball and you throw it down into the puddle as hard as you can. What happens? You get a splash, right? You have a lot of that water goes flying up and out. And in a lot of cases, you throw this, this tennis ball at that puddle hard enough, all of that water doesn't wind up making its way back into the puddle. The puddle is now a little bit more shallow because you've splashed some of that water out by this tennis ball that is as big around as the depth of that puddle and it impacted with, 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 with a high rate of speed. We found out from experimentation that the particles that go into the atmosphere after an impact, particles that go into the atmosphere after a volcanic eruption, particles that go in the air whenever we load sulfur dioxide up on a plane, take it to the ionosphere and begin spraying it around, they don't stay in the atmosphere very long. Most of them are already settled out within about three or four days or so. So unless you have a continuous and ongoing event that produces a large volume of these particles, you aren't going to get a cooling effect from doing it. So the geoengineering engineering experiments that have been done already and are no longer being done have demonstrated that you can't really spray anything and cool the planet off, not effectively. <clears throat> so what does that mean? Well, that means something else happened to the dinosaurs. And the thing that happened to the dinosaurs was a loss of atmosphere. Whenever you're a big creature the size of Tyrannosaurus rex, arr, you take a look at this, this monstrosity, you take a look at the size of its ribcage, the size of a rest of its body, imagine what its musculature must be like, and I'll imagine how it's going to pump blood full of oxygen to all of its extremities and still be able to get up and move. There's a problem. It's too small. Well, its chest cavity is too small. It doesn't have the heart that it would need to do that. It doesn't have the lungs that it's going to need to do that. How is it possible for the T-Rex to even be able to get up and walk if it had this, our atmosphere? Well, it didn't have our atmosphere. It had the atmosphere before the Chicxulub impact. But after this, all these large theropods, they can't live anymore. They start dying off. And there was a, dis, there was a, a difference in, in the rate of die-off between things that happened in the oceans and things that happened on the surface. Remember, the surface lost its atmosphere, a chunk of its atmosphere. Now, there is a relationship in proportion to atmosphere that's, that's gaseous, an atmosphere that's in solution and a liquid. There is a ratio and a proportion. Whenever one of them is diminished, the other one will just diminish it also in relationship. But as we've already determined, the, the CO2 that we exhale is not being picked up by the oceans, turned into oxygen, and returned back to us. This is not what's going on. Um, the end result was the creatures in the oceans did experience the same die-off, just not at the same time. So they lagged behind a little. This is what you would expect to happen if the if the, the cause of the die-off was suffocation, lack of sufficient oxygen to survive. See, part of our atmosphere is oxygen. We lose some of our atmosphere, we lose oxygen. Currently, the ratio is around 20%, a little under, I think, 20% oxygen. And that's what we're surviving on, 20% oxygen. At one time, it was a much more dense atmosphere. 
when you took that breath, but there were more molecules of oxygen that came into your lungs. You didn't need to have larger lungs to get more oxygen. You just needed to take a breath. That's all you needed to do. And you had more oxygen entering your lungs than we have now because we have a more we had a more dense atmosphere. 12,800 years, years or so ago, there was another large impact event. And it wasn't one that created one big massive crater. This was multiple smaller impacts spread across a, a larger area. But we've also discovered that smaller impactors, once again, strip atmosphere. And if this was a large number, and apparently from the indigenous stories that we have for North America, it was a large number that were coming in, flaming rocks falling from the sky. They saw them. Around the world on the other side, in the Mediterranean basin, whenever this large disruption occurred, whenever large amounts of atmosphere was evacuated, the same thing happened then that happens now whenever there's a drop in atmospheric pressure. But <laughs> by golly, it started raining and it rained a lot. I mean, a lot. Some ocean levels rose. One of the dams that the Straits of Gibraltar breached and the waters came rushing in. Civilizations around the Mediterranean experienced rapid rapid flooding to the point where the entire civilization overnight wiped away. People recorded this. They also recorded that following this event, people did not live as long as they used to. And now, of course, we understand the science behind this, how it happened and what happened. So when I, whenever I hear stories about someone saying mankind uh, your purpose here when we put you on this planet is to replenish and restore the planet i'm thinking there's actually a purpose a reason behind it there's something that's happened there's a reason why humans are needed to do this work and there's a reason why humans are best suited for this work uh, whenever i'm going around and looking at an ecosystem trying to optimize an, e an ecosystem i'm looking for an animal that's going to fill a niche i'm looking for a creature that's going to control a pest maybe provide a feedback loop do something to cause this ecosystem to balance itself and to stay functioning and, and vibrant, thriving for, for years on into the future. The keystone species to making this planet thrive, the one thing that we need to have, and we really do, in fact, need to have more of, is human beings. Guys, that's my show for, show for tonight. I'm very, very grateful for y'all for showing up, and I thank you for your kind attention. If you found the video informative or entertaining, you know what to do. I'm going to catch you next time, but until then, get out there and get growing. And I am going to go down in comments just before I take off and say some last goodbyes to everybody. <laughs> Billy says he'll drive me. You'd have to come out here to Oklahoma, pick me up, drive me out, drive me out to Alabama. Hey, I, 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 I would be, I would be more than happy to come out and visit David. Absolutely. I have to bring you some locust plants or locust trees or something. Lori is reporting, this is from Canada, our government employees went on strike today, over 155,000 of them. Heck, yeah. You know, most, most of the Canadian police, Canadian employees, and people, people in government, they're not liking this stuff any more than anyone else. I, I, I saw whenever the, uh, the trucker convoy was going on in Ottawa last year, and that first night, Whenever the uh, it was the Ottawa, Ottawa police had come out and the people had come out at nighttime again, and at first they had surrounded the, the trucker convoy, and then at night came and the people came out too. It wasn't just the truckers; everybody came out, and the people surrounded the police. and And they weren't fighting, they weren't pushing, they weren't shoving. They were just sitting there talking to them, holding conversations, and, and treating them like like human beings, and reaching them. I think on, on a personal level. The next day, you didn't see the Ottawa Police Department coming out there whenever the atrocities happened. It wasn't the Ottawa Police Department. And of course, you know, they, they couldn't really, you can't do something like that and turn around and, and try to enforce law in that city ever again. And saying, hi, you can't do this to, you, to, to, to your people and try to enforce law in this country again. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Oh, this needs a wash. I still got my shirt. Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> it's getting too warm for it. <laughs> oh, Billy. <laughs> Good.
have some cuttings. Get, get some of the Rachel Mul Mulberry cuttings. Wait a minute, wait a minute. They have caffeine? I thought they were only used as a, as a coffee substitute. And that was just so they would taste nasty. They actually, if they have actually have caffeine, that would be interesting. It would be very, very interesting. I don't think I want to like grow a whole bunch of them just for a coffee substitute, but if they have caffeine, that would be interesting. All right. Heterodox is reporting another drought year. We're yeah, we're we're I've I've been having to break out the hose and uh cause a mist to rise up from the ground to water the garden, if you know what I mean. Uh, don't like it. Uh looked like we were gonna get some rain maybe today. It hasn't it hasn't materialized. Maybe we'll get it tonight. Hopefully, we'll see. Uh, highly oxygenated atmosphere, everything was big. Not only the not only the, the animals were big, but the Plant life was big as well. This is kind of one of the clues, right? If we're looking around going, okay, the animals are big. They have to have lots of oxygen in their atmosphere to be able to do this. But the plant life is big too. So there was lots of oxygen and there was lots of carbon dioxide. What does that tell us? Oh, bingo, light goes off. It was a more dense atmosphere. And of course, right now, if you want to, to engage in a little bit of life extension therapy, uh, a hyperbaric chamber is a great way to do it. So why is it that a hyperbaric chamber is going to extend your lifespan, right? <laughs> it's 133 trillion tons of atmosphere that we'd have to replace on planet Earth in order for the atmosphere to be optimized for human life. We're, we're, sitting, in, we're sitting around suffocating right now. We're in suffoc a suffocating environment. The plant life is in a suffocating environment. We have a diminished atmosphere. If we have more of those impacts again, uh, we may not survive. Maybe the little people who live in the jungle and in, in, in the Congo might survive. Oh, wait, we're destroying the Congo habitat that they live in. So maybe they won't survive either. <clears throat> yeah, the, the idea of the, the ferment of water um, is kind of interesting because when we're talking about this, the the sea and the sky being separated and the space in between is called the heavens, if we remember this from, from the Genesis story. There is the water that is in the heavens, and there was a lot of water in the heavens. Uh, at some point in the past, the ocean levels were a lot lower than they are today. People were able to walk around there, build buildings out there, and you, you can find these places that are submerged, and you can look at that and go, okay, when in the past was this sea level that low? And, of course, things happened. We had... We had um, water that fell from the sky con condensed the kept fell out of the sky if we increase the temperature on planet earth we would wind up evaporating a lot of surface water so the idea that oh no the ocean levels are going to rise if, if the temperature goes up this is this is incorrect if the temperature goes up we're going to lose a certain amount of, of ice that is melted or ice that winds up melting and it becomes liquid water this portion that's over water already has already displaced its mass. So whenever it melts, it doesn't do anything. It's the, the water level remains constant. There's a little bit over, over land that whenever it melts can wind up going in, in, into the water. But once again, whenever we increase that by even one millimeter, we have increased by a greater magnitude surface area that can evaporate. And water has more than water has more than two phases, but it also has a gaseous phase. So a certain amount of water vapor is going to wind up going into the atmosphere and being held in gaseous phase fairly much indefinitely in something, unless something happens to cause a reduction in atmospheric pressure, in which case it will condense out of the atmosphere and fall as rain. That's what happens whenever, whenever we have civilizations that are that reporting this great flood, wipes out their civilization. It rains like it's never rained before. Oh my gosh, what is it? And around here on the other side of the world, the, the people who live here got to see it was an angry puma throwing fiery rocks as it passed across the sky. And I, I, I wonder about that description, an angry puma. It's like, why would they say an angry puma? What's, what is it? And of course, I know what sound a puma makes. It's, it's a screaming sound 
almost kind of like a high pitched noise, like a woman screaming. So maybe the sound that these rocks make, that the asteroid impactors make, as they're skimming through the atmosphere on their way across whenever they entered somewhere just to the west of the Great Lakes area and before they impacted around the coast from Virginia down to down to, to, to South Carolina, right? It, it created those, those, those impact areas over there. The people watching may have heard the screaming sound. And he's describing a screaming sound, a shrieking sound. And it's just like an angry puma. And that's why we get the story passed on that way. Because these were oral stories. And people are trying to pass down information in a, in a way that that is relatable. I, I can't tell you about airplanes if you've never seen one. I can tell you it's a great metal beast that flies. And people can get in it. It goes across the planet. Belches fire. Next thing you know, you've invented a dragon. So, um, All right, so 21% oxygen. There we go, around 21%. And yeah, also this explains the giant giant insects. Things that cannot support each other in the current, uh, the current atmospheric pressure and levels can, can't live. But in the past, they could. It's because we had a more dense atmosphere. Um, and yeah, yeah, okay, so <laughs> not, not to... Not, 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 not to point out the elephant of the room, but there's a place called Puma Punku that where if you go to now and try to walk around and examine these these wonderful megalithic structures, they're not huge rocks. I mean, they're they're a couple of tons, but they're they're not huge, huge, but they're they're some, somewhat substantial. But they're cut so precisely, and they're made out of such very very hard material that's hard to cut to begin with, with such precision, and they're have obviously been brought from elsewhere to here. And then the overburden that was there has been removed and taken somewhere else that we have no idea where it went. And the track that you used to get up, up to this place to visit in the first place is, is, is a goat track. How did they get these blocks up there again? Whenever walking around just looking at them makes you exhausted because there's not enough air. These altitudes for you to breathe. And you can talk about, oh, the natives, they used to live there and they're adapted to living on. Hey, the natives aren't walking around up there either. They come up for the tours. They chew a few coca leaves whenever they're there and go, I'm glad you're paying me for this stuff. I couldn't live here. Nobody can. Not now, anyway. But once upon a time, they were building great structures over there. What does that tell you about these structures? If we can date that loss of atmosphere, the major loss of atmosphere, to about 12,800 years ago. What well, means those structures were there at least 12,800 years ago, before 12,800 years ago. What does it tell us about the age of mankind? Sounds like we may have missed a couple chapters. Or some of those indigenous stories that we hear from various places, they're absolutely true. And these people are trying to tell us things that happened in our past. We're just like, oh, crazy stories, you know. Those, 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 those indigenous peoples, they don't know what they're talking about. Because we know, right? We know that mankind left Africa just a couple thousand years ago. Well, whenever you, whenever you have gas in solution and you warm the, the solution, the gas comes out of solution. Whenever you have gas that is not in solution and you cool the gas and you cool the solution, the gas goes into solution. So CO2 levels in, in, in oceans and in ice cores would be a result of cooling, not warming. Warming would cause them to leave. So, yeah, the, the, the rise in CO2 follows warming. And CO2 works as, as a, a climate regulator, so more CO2 would be a blessing. Plants would do great. Um, CO2 is what I think 0 0.04. Oh, yeah, yeah, Ron, you answered your own question right after that. Point zero four percent of the atmosphere. Um, there is a problem with burning fossil fuels. The problem with burning fossil fuels is whenever we burn fossil fuels, or really in, I don't even want to say fossil fuels, it's not accurate. When we oxidize a fuel, we'll put it that way. When we oxidize fuel to create heat and light and whatever else we need, combustion, the oxygen that we're using for this comes from our supply of atmospheric oxygen. It's now bonded with whatever is being oxidized. And it stays bonded until we can separate those bonds. Now, nature does this through photosynthesis. It'll take the CO2 from the air. It's going to take a little bit of water vapor, a bit of sunlight, for, for the supply of energy to break those bonds, and it now creates 
a glucose molecule and it goes exhales oxygen. But it's only giving us the oxygen back that was locked up whenever we oxidized the fuel in the first place. And once again, I don't care what kind of fuel it is. It could be some carbon-based fuel. It could be some metal that we're oxidizing. Either way, it doesn't matter. Well, I guess it does because if it's a metal that we're oxidizing, a plant isn't going to be able to photosynthesize it back out. It can do that with carbon dioxide. It can't do that with some exotic metallic oxide that we might be using to, to, to generate heat by oxidizing it. Thermite, for example. <laughs> Uh, if you've ever made a thermite. Fun stuff. Great to play with. Keep it away from small children. Um, so, yeah. We burn we burn fossil fuels. We, we take carbon from deep underground, turn it into carbon dioxide, turn the carbon dioxide into stored energy, sugars, uh, maybe soil organic matter. So the end result of burning fossil fuels, if the biosphere is handling it properly, is we have an increase in soil organic matter that's not a bad thing not a problem fossil fuels aren't the problem but they're not the solution either because once again that see that carbon goes into the atmosphere for a temporary period of time gets processed by a biosphere now it becomes organic matter and we just have the same oxygen that we had before we haven't increased atmospheric density at all there's only a few things that increase our atmospheric density now, you might think, well, meteors falling from outside might add some density. Yeah, they do, about 40,000 tons every year. But we lose much more than that, around 95,000 tons or so uh, of atmosphere just from hydrogen escaping our thermosphere. Well, some of that's some of that's helium, too. It's 16,000 tons of helium. But most of it's hydrogen. So we lose more just with the light particles bouncing out of our thermosphere every year than we get in physical mass coming in from impactors. And those impactors are mostly nickel, iron, steel, silicon, nickel, iron, and silicon, mostly those materials. Those aren't atmospheric components. We're not getting atmosphere back out here. Just we're losing it. We're, and we're losing lots of it. And we've been losing lots of it. And the fact that it's so big and there's so much of it is the reason why it takes us such a long time for people to notice, like, hey, you know what? It's actually getting harder to breathe these days. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting to an age now where I've noticed this. Uh, it was a lot easier when I was younger. Then again, I hadn't smoked as much. I've given up the smoking. My lung capacity is coming back. But still, I've noticed a definite diminishment in the amount of quality that I get from every breath I take. Even though I can take probably more of a breath than a lot of people out there who have never smoked first place simply because i've been training myself to have more full complete breaths more compression trying to get that oxygen into, into the alve alveoli into my bloodstream um it's great for your health makes you feel good uh, it's not habit forming well i guess maybe it is habit forming <laughs> breathing is very habit forming we should all become addicted to it um so yeah it's the co2 that's in the atmosphere is 0.04 percent it's not a whole lot um we keep it cycling around to produce oxygen if the concentration winds up growing, as it has recently, uh, then the, 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 the solution, well, I think 50 years ago, it was like 0. 0.38. <laughs> it, like, it was the same. For, it, was, it was a little bit less. It has gone up some. Um, ideally, if we kept the same atmospheric density, the CO2 concentration should hit uh, at least 800 parts per million. To, to, to make most of the plant life happy. Um, that would be a radical difference from, from today. In any case, only a couple things are producing atmosphere. Volcanoes do it whenever they spew out their carbon dioxide. They're not taking oxygen from the atmosphere and bonding it with carbon to make carbon dioxide. They're taking carbonate rock and cooking it and superheating it and then spewing out that carbon dioxide. That's fossilized air. That's carbon and oxygen bonded together that are being released by the heat of the earth and coming out of those vents. That's extra atmosphere that we didn't have before. Now, if our biosphere is healthy and it can take that CO2, break the bonds using sunlight to produce oxygen, water vapor, and stored energy, biomass, um, soil organic matter, things that make uh, our, our 
our planet healthier, then we've actually increased our atmospheric density, managed to replenish some of the atmosphere. And if humans are just planting forest gardens and we have plenty of volcanism, then we will be steadily replenishing our atmosphere. Humans could do more. Uh, but the one thing that humans do that produces atmosphere is making concrete. It's the one thing we do that actually generates atmosphere. But we don't have a need for as much concrete as it would take to replace 133 trillion tons of atmosphere. So this is one of the things that we can really work on now that we actually know what the problem is and know what the solution is. It is something that we can work on, but we would have to really be dedicated to working on replenishing the atmosphere and understand what we're doing. We are trying to replenish the atmosphere. We're trying to recharge the atmosphere. We're trying to increase atmospheric density so that humans will live longer so that trees will grow taller, so that the other life on planet Earth can be great and abundant the way it's intended to be, so that we can live in a, in, in a garden world the way we are intended to, uh, the way we are, dare I say it, designed, purpose-built for. There we go. So, guys, yes, going to sign off. I, I can see the comments still going. So many wonderful comments. All you guys, I'd love to spend more time. But as you can notice from the little icon up there, where is it? No, there, there, there. Powered by StreamYard. I'm on the free plan. So <laughs> I have to ration my time online. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And once again, I will catch you next time. Good night, everybody.